Uh, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight um, for the first installment of the second season of the Delaware Department of Correction Insider Series webinars. Uh, we took a little hiatus after the first um, eight installments and we are back again. So appreciate your patience if we're just a little bit rusty in, um, in some of the functions here. Uh, my name is Heather Zwickert. I'm the Chief of Planning, Research and Reentry for the department and I'll be the moderator for this evening's session. Uh, planning, research, and reentry, for those who aren't aware, is a specialized unit in the Office of the Commissioner that oversees and coordinates uh, prisoner reentry initiatives, leads the department's data collection and analysis efforts, facilitates strategic planning, oversees accreditation and compliance, and provides project and grant management for multi bureau initiatives. Today's or this evening's presenters are Deputy Chief of uh, Bureau of Community Corrections, Heidi Collier, and Probation and Parole Director, Melissa Kearney. Director Collier has been with the DOC for 18 years. Uh, she began her career as a correctional officer at James T. Vaughan. She went on to become a probation and parole officer, rising to the ranks of PNP supervisor before returning to the Bureau of Prisons to serve as the Director of Classification and Special Programs in 2018. In 2021, she was appointed to her current position, um, Deputy Chief of Community Corrections. And the Bureau of Community Corrections oversees um, a variety of things for the department, right? So probation and parole, pretrial services, uh, the community work release program, electronic monitoring, and other supervision programs uh, for more than 10,000 individuals statewide who are housed either in uh, work release or violation of probation centers, the statewide community correction treatment centers, or are serving a probation sentence in the community. And then we have uh, Director Kearney. And Director Kearney joined the department um, as a probation and parole officer in 1995. She was promoted to probation and parole supervisor in 2001 and specialized in domestic violence and free trial supervision. Director Kearney established the Victim Services Program for Probation and Parole in Newcastle County in 2001, and that program now operates statewide. In 2020, 2020 at the start of the COVID pandemic, uh, Director Kearney was promoted to regional manager of Cherry Lane Probation and Parole Office, which is the um, largest um, probation office in the department, and then was promoted to PMP Director in 2021. Director Kearney is a member of the department's critical incident stress management team and serves as the deputy contract, um, sorry, compact administrator for um, the Interstate Commission for Adult Offenders Ascender. Let me try that again. Interstate Commission for Adult Offender Supervision for the State of Delaware. And Director Kearney has a BS in community service, community and family services from the University of Delaware. So thank you so much to Deputy Chief Collier and Director Kearney uh, for joining us tonight to provide some information about probation and parole today. So tonight's agenda um, will include information on the role of the probation and parole officer, uh, getting started on probation, types of supervision, what to expect while under supervision, uh, specialized caseloads and task forces, services that are offered at PMP, how to complete a probation and parole term. Uh, at the end, um, we'll also give information um, about ways to get involved and connected, and we'll have a period for Q&A. We do ask that you submit uh, questions through the Q&A box um, on your Zoom screen versus in the chat. It's easier for us to kind of manage that way. Um, and at the end, um, at the conclusion of the presentation, I'll select some questions from the Q&A uh, to post to our presenters. We obviously won't be able to get to everyone's questions during the uh, webinar, uh, but if you ask your question, we'll attempt to, um, you know, kind of follow up afterwards via email with any questions that we aren't able to get to. If you do ask your question um, anonymously, though, know that if we aren't able to answer it during the webinar, we won't be able to get up with you after um, because we won't know who asked the question. So if you want um, us to be able to follow up, you'll need to ask the question um, uh, using your name, no one, um, only the panelists can see the Q&A box. So if that's a concern also, just know that only the people who um, are running the, the webinar can see the Q&A box. And also keep in mind that we aren't able to answer questions about specific individuals or their experiences under DOC supervision during the webinar, um, but we can refer you to the um, appropriate parties for questions of that nature. The webinar, as always, um, is recorded and it will be posted on the department's YouTube channel. You're actually able to go back and view the previous eight webinars um, on our YouTube channel. We do make the PowerPoint available after the webinar and we do supply um, certificates of attendance for those who stay tuned for the entire webinar. So 
Um, if you if you ask for a for a certificate, we do kind of check and make sure that you stayed in for you stayed tuned in for the for the majority of the webinar, and then we can issue you a certificate of attendance. One of the other things that we do is we conduct polls throughout the webinar to kind of keep things interactive. The answers to the polls are anonymous. Um, and the first poll um, question we'd like to pose today is to kind of get a sense of who's joining us. So you should see a poll um, coming up on your screen right now um, that asks you to kind of identify what stakeholder group best describes you. Um, so we have some uh, different options up here. So if everybody could just take a minute and kind of weigh in as to what group uh, you think best describes you and we'll brief that um, in a minute or so. Thanks a lot for participating. Everybody I see is chiming in pretty quickly. And I'll just give it another couple of seconds. All right, last couple of seconds. Anybody else wants to chime in with their stakeholder group? All right, I'll go ahead and end it now, and then I can share uh, results. Can can we see the results? Yeah. Okay. So it looks like we have a lot of um, department employees on the webinar, which is great. I feel like. Um, we always have a lot of department um, uh, attendance where, you know, staff can learn about things that are happening in other parts of the department, which is great, especially after hours. I think that's nice that everyone is kind of on. We have some other state um, agency employees. We have uh, uh, quite a few people from um, nonprofit organizations, either employees or volunteers. We have community members, um, advocates, some students on some people from the legal community, some people from the media, and some people who fell kind of under the other designation. So um, a nice kind of uh, mix of stakeholders joining us this evening. So thank you very much. Let me stop sharing that. And then um, I now will turn it over to uh, Deputy Chief Collier and Director Kearney, Kearney um, to, to go through our presentation. I appreciate the introduction, Heather. As the chief mentioned, my name is Heidi Collier and I have the privilege of serving as the Department of Corrections Deputy Bureau Chief. I wanna take a moment to just recognize Heather and Planning Research and Reentry Team for their efforts to bring us all together tonight to discuss probation and parole today and the behind the scenes work that they perform to support the Bureau of Community Corrections. So thank you, Heather, and to your team for all your efforts that goes on behind the scenes. It's very much appreciated. So I will kick us off with some general, but very important information before we kind of dive into the probation and parole practices. The state of Delaware has five district offices throughout the state and several satellite offices. So kind of beginning in Newcastle County, we'll start with the Northern Newcastle County Probation and Parole Office. You're gonna hear it throughout this presentation known as Cherry Lane. This is the largest district office under the leadership of manager Marcus Thompson and Mike Gomez. And Harris Corner, located in Newcastle, is under the leadership of Jeff Boykin. Newcastle, I'm sorry, in Kent County, coming on down state, is under the supervision of Manager Keisha Winchester. And in Sussex County, in Georgetown, and Seaford Probation Office is managed by Dave Johnson. Next slide. Heather, could you hit the next slide, please? Chief? There we go, thank you. Oh, there we go, too far. All right, there we go, thank you, ma'am. So each time I need, need a new officer or a staff member starting with the Department of Correction, I always ask a question, why do they choose to work in the department? And I'm always inspired by the answers of many staff reports, such as they wanna make a difference in the community, they are devoted to the safety of our family, friends, and neighbors, or they want to help individuals become more successful in their lives. So when you read our mission statement and listen to the officers and staff member, their message is clear. They choose to serve Delaware communities with pride, passion, and purpose. 
slide, please. So this section of Delaware code grants the authority to probation and parole officers to perform essential functions for public safety as directed by the court, the judge, or the board of parole. So statutory and department procedures kind of set that foundation for that balanced approach to law enforcement functions, probation and parole officers perform each day. So the roles of a probation and parole officer. As I just mentioned, we have a we want that balanced approach. So probation officers must perform, must fill many different roles and oftentimes kind of switch mindsets based on the events or communication. Some of those things may include counseling to help influence person's behavior or listen to problems or work on goals to overcome obstacles in their lives. Evaluation to, sub, to substantiate individual problems for the purpose of interventions. Community work, officers go into the community and conduct home visits, employer verification, and other activities to engage with individuals under supervision. Additionally, officers participate in community outreach programs, which we'll discuss a little bit later. Case management, using community resources to obtain additional counseling and treatment for those under the supervision. Or an advocate, providing assistance or support to reach resolutions to address certain problems. On the other side of their role, officers must engage in an investigation where credible information suggests in individuals may be a threat to the community, a victim, or themselves. Officers perform surveillance or monitor individuals' actions and behaviors that may lead to criminal charges. Officers will report their findings to the court or sentencing authority based on the information collected and perform enforcement actions based on the totality of the case and the threat to public safety. Probation officers are the eyes and ears of the court and our communities. Probation and parole functions are critical for community safety and require specific training and a very unique skill set to be able to transition between many different roles, often in a moment's notice. Next slide, please. So over the years, I've heard discussions that compared Delaware to other states. Delaware is one of six states in the US with what's called a unified correctional system. What that means is that all of our correctional facilities fall under one jurisdiction. In other states, pretrial, short-term sentences are often held in city or county jails. Delaware, all classifications, whether your pretrial, your jail, or your prison sentence falls under our department. This allows our team to evaluate and provide statistical information more concisely. So in Delaware, there are, we have five levels of supervision, and I'm going to discuss each level just to provide an overview. So you'll hear a lot of times someone is serving a level five sentence. This includes persons serving a one or more year prison term or a jail sentence, which may be one year or less. Because we're a unified system, we differentiate between the prison population by one year or more and then the jail population with one year or less. Also, we have the detentioner populations which are pending a core proceeding in our level five settings. Level four is our quasi-incarceration, which includes our work release, treatment, violation of probation centers, and home confinement. As we focus this presentation on probation and parole, level four home confinement sentences fall under the probation and parole supervision. Home confinement supervision restricts individuals to their home except for pro-social activities, including employment, schooling, any programming, or reporting to their officer as assigned. Individuals must have proof of residence and officers must inv investigate the housing plan to evaluate compliance and safety. Level three. Level three is our intensive or we say high risk supervision. This level has the most frequent contact between the officer and the person under supervision. Level two is our standard or moderate supervision. That's typically less contact between the officer and the person being supervised. Level one administrative or low risk supervision is our lowest level of community supervision. This is the least frequent contact between the officer and the person being supervised. And we also have something known as level one restitution only. Typically these cases are for people who owe restitution, which may be challenging to collect in full before, the, before a higher level of supervision ends. So there are occasions when some people are directly ordered to either restitution only or they're flowed to a restitution only caseload. Okay. Next 
So in Delaware, there are four types of supervision categories. We have probation, we have parole, we have interstate, and we have pretrial. The vast majority of people will fall under probation and parole supervision. And they're sentenced directly from the, from the Delaware courts. And parole was abolished in 1990 with the, adoption of truth and, with the adoption of the Truth and Sentencing Act. And the department continues to supervise a small population who were sentenced before this abolishment and are eligible for possible release through the Delaware Board of Parole under the authority of the board. Interstate supervision is cases where an individual is ordered to a period of probation or parole supervision in another state and has their supervision transferred to the state of Delaware, or the individual is sentenced in Delaware and has applied for transfer to another state. The Interstate Commission for Adult Offender Supervision, ICAOS, kind of guides that transfer of the individuals in a manner that kind of prom that promotes effective supervision strategies consistent with public safety with federal guidelines and laws to ensure that we are in compliance. And then lastly, pretrial, we supervises defendants to the community pending a trial with bail conditions as ordered by the court. And later in this presentation, Director Kearney will kind of provide more information and context about each category as we discuss through the topics. Next slide, Next slide please. All right, so now I think we're gonna jump in and launch another poll uh, real quick. So um, we're gonna move on kind of to talk about the population of probation and parole. So let me launch poll number two. So our question um, to the group is about how many people are currently under uh, probation and parole supervision in the state of Delaware? Um, so I have, we have option A, 4,500, B, 8,500, C, uh, 10,000, and D, 25,000. So I'll give everybody a minute to kind of weigh in. Again, remember your answers are anonymous. So if anybody is kind of like, oh, I don't want to guess wrong, then they're going to know. Uh, we can't see who answers um, what questions. And we'll just give, give everyone another few seconds to answer. You guys are quick, though. Thank you. All right, another second if anybody wants to put in a last minute answer. All right, I'm going to close out the poll and I'm going to share results. So it looks like um, we have kind of, kind of close between 8,500 and 10,000 um, being the answer. So uh, I'll let you know uh, that the correct answer um, right now is uh, C, approximately 10,000 individuals under probation supervision from uh, level one restitution only through level four home confinement. Um, and um, so looks like people are kind of really in tune um, to how many people we have under supervision, which is great. So I'll stop sharing that. Yeah, I just wanted to on. say that anyone can go on the Depart Department of Correction website and get a real time number and look and see how many people are on probation or on pretrial. Um, and who are incarcerated. So it gives a real time update uh, if you go to the website. Yes, and you can also actually view, um, in addition to the department's website for kind of real time uh, population data, if you um, search the Delaware Open Data Portal, um, the Delaware Department of Correction pushes um, a lot of data over there, along with a bunch of other state agencies, pushes data over there um, monthly, and you'll, you can uh, see kind of uh, uh, population information, you know, it's usually about a month behind, but you'll be able to see a lot of historical information also um, that you can kind of sort, um, it, you know, it breaks it down um, with types of sentences, it breaks it down by um, race, race, sex, um, a whole bunch of uh, different things that you can kind of look at. Uh, Department of Correction data is available on the Open Data Portal. Um, but now we'll have uh, Deputy Chief Collier talk to us a little bit about uh, what's happened with the probation and parole um, population over the last several decades. So this slide is definitely for my history buffs. The information captured in the snapshot is critical to the operation as it provides kind of that historical perspective of the changes that impact probation and parole from 1979 to 2021. I mean, these numbers represent kind of a point in time in each, calendar, in each calendar year. Starting in 1979, there were a total of 4,089 people under supervision. And that number continued to rise to a high of 21,610 in 1999. 
through various legislation initiatives, the probation parole population has con continued to steadily drop. These numbers do not include people ordered to pretrial supervision, which has increased over the last several years with the passage of the Bail Reform Act. Pretrial population over the last several years has shown will be shown at a later date or a later slide. But some of those legislative initiatives that's impacted Delaware probation and parole include in 1990, 1990, the Truth and Sentencing Act, where I discussed parole that abolished the right to parole and limited the amount of good time an incarcerated person could earn. As a result of no, par no parole, probation numbers increased. Then we had in May 20, 2003, Senate Bill 50, also known as the Probation Reform Law, passed legislation. The law changed probation sentences to be served concurrently or simultaneously instead of consecutively one after the other. Senate Bill 50 set probation term limits on most sentences to two years for violent felonies, 18 months for drug offenses, and then one year for other offenses. The legislation allowed DOC to resolve technical and minor violations administratively to include the use of administrative commitments, the ability to change a person's supervision level following the use of an objective evidence-based classification tool, and the creation of the level one restitution only. Then in August 2022, SB 226, also known as the Justice Reinvestment Act, was passed in the legislation, and that changed the calculation of conditional release sentences and provided good time on probation sentences. So this act allowed for the implementation of graduated responses and to address compliance and non-compliance. So in some sentences, it is permit, based off Senate Bill 226, it's permitted to discharge from probation without court approval. And I realize that is probably a lot of information. We're not gonna test on it, but I do wanna emphasize the importance of the history. When we wrap up tonight's presentation, we will revisit some of this information to discuss probation and parole today. But now I wanna go ahead and turn it over to Director Kearney to take us into getting started in probation. Thank you, Deputy Chief. So uh, at court, the sentencing authority orders a person to probation. So it's a judge or commissioner that will order a sentence uh, for a period of incarceration and you will suspend it even, even either after serving a term of incarceration or suspended immediately for a probation term. The court imp imposes a term or length of sentence, the level and the special condition. So I think that this is kind of a, a, a unknown fact that a majority of those on probation never serve a jail sentence. Most are court ordered uh, to probation directly from court. Next slide. For those individuals who are sentenced to incarceration, he or she may engage with a probation and parole officer while, during their time at level five for the purpose of re-entering into the community. Re-entry involves in-reach coordinators who are probation officers who are assigned to a specific level four or five institution. They provide discharge planning, pre-release workshops, and one-on-one -on -one discharge planning for individuals pre-release. The eligibility requirements uh, for those to engage in in-reach re-entry planning is one year or more of a level five sentence for men and six months or more for women. Now, some incarcerated individuals do decline and refuse the in-reach services. I just figured I would point that out to the group. The in-reach coordinators work with treatment tre teams inside of the facilities and maintain communication pre-release. They collaborate with our contracted uh, mental health and substance abuse providers within the facilities um, for care and medication and medically assisted treatment. Uh, the the um, releasee is provided with 30 day supply of medication upon release. And the in-reach coordinators assist with helping individuals get credential cards, such as uh, which helps them get birth certificates and obtain ident identifications. Uh, they help with social security cards, DHSS applications, temporary housing, and other services as needed. So 
so there are two ways that people are signed up for probation. Like I said, there's those that who are incarcerated and get released and are sentenced to probation. And then there's those, those who go to court and are sentenced to probation directly from court. So um, for those who are sentenced directly from court, they go to the intake office. And in both Newcastle and Kent County, the intake office is located within the courthouse. At Georgetown, it is located next door to the Georgetown Probation Office. So an intake officer, come, um, they report to intake. Uh, the intake officer will go over their conditions of supervision, their sentencing information, and let them know who they're assigned to and where they are to report to. For those who are incarcerated, they will be assigned um, by an intake officer who's an institutional release officer. So the institutional release officer will actually go into the facility and sign the person up 30 days or more prior to their release. So when they get out, they know who they're to report to. At that time, they also go over their conditions of supervision and sentencing information. Individuals are given 72 hours to contact his or her uh, probation officer. Next slide. As, as Deputy Chief Collier said, there are locations uh, throughout the state, uh, district office locations throughout the state. Individuals are assigned based on the county that he or she resides in. So it's not based on work convenience, it's based on where they reside. They are assigned based on the proximity of their residence, but there are also specialized units that may change where they are with the location assignments. For example, in Newcastle County, the domestic violence unit is housed at the Harris Corner office, but the home confinement unit is, is housed at the Cherry Lane office. They're both in close proximity. They're both in Newcastle, but um, there may be adjustments to their district office assignment based on their caseload specialization. And there is an office located in Seaford for those who live in the western part of Sussex County. Next slide. All right, so the intake process, I, I, I kind of went over that already. Um, so they meet with the intake officer, uh, an individual will meet with the intake officer, they'll go over the conditions of supervision, they'll uh, go over their sentence, they will give the officer's name, address, and phone number, they'll give specific reporting instructions, and if there's not a specific time to report, again, they're given 72 hours. They're given a copy of their signed conditions so they know what the expectations are, and they sign a financial acknowledgement related to restitution. Um, the acknowledgement form used to also include a supervision fee. Um, however, uh, House Bill 244 was signed by the governor in October of 2022 and becomes effective April 2023. So, it, um, so as of April 2023, supervision fees will no longer be assessed for those uh, sentenced to probation, and we're in the process of changing our forms. Once the sentence individual is assigned to an officer, the supervising officer, again, will go over the conditions of supervision and any relevant information. Um, at that time, any questions are asked um, related to their supervision, and uh, referrals are made at that time to any court-ordered programs. I'm gonna go over the standard conditions of probation. And these, these conditions were carefully considered by the CENTAC, which is the Sentence Accountability Commission, which represents many stakeholders in the state of Delaware. So it, what it, this isn't a DOC thing, this is a stakeholders within the system who came up with these standard conditions. And they're designed to promote rehabilitation, to keep the public safe, and to reduce a chance, a chance to return to criminal behavior. And these conditions are in Delaware are similar to the standards in the surrounding states. Condition number one, of course, is someone has to stay out of trouble while they're under supervision. Um, condition two, uh, they need to report any new arrest convictions or police contacts within 72 hours. The condition three is, th is that they have to report at such times and places as directed and allow the officer to visit their home or place of employment. And I, I just wanna point out that we've made a lot of progress with this condition. 
Um, the old school way was a level three person had to report every Wednesday. This is my reporting day. You have to come in every Wednesday. My reporting hours are eight to four. You have to come in between eight and four. And, and we've made some concessions and um, realized that we want to make it easier for people um, on probation. So uh, we've kind of changed our old way of doing business. Um, right now, our policy is for high risk offenders or level three, they have to report only, or there's only two required face to face contacts. So that can be in the community and it can be in the office. Um, and then two indirect contacts. So a total of four, but the indirect contacts can be by telephone or by any other electronic means. Um, so we've tried to impact, uh, try to minimize the impact of, of interrupting somebody's day who, who's working to have to report to the probation office. However, these are the minimum requirements. And if somebody is non-compliant, there, there may be requirements that um, have them come in more often. Um, and sometimes the office visit is, is to refer them to programs or to, uh, we have program programming within our our offices so sometimes it's a you know an appointment to to see a case manager or to see a substance abuse evaluator in addition to meeting with their probation officer for moderate risk level two the minimum contact requirements are now one direct face-to-face -face per month and low risk it's it's required as needed and I know Chief Collier kind of went over that already Condition number four basically states that you need authorization to leave the state of Delaware. And again, this is part of our interstate rules and we actually need to have someone sign a, a permit to, to leave the state. And the things that are considered when issuing a travel permit are, is the person complying with their probation? Is it a pro, pro social reason for their travel? Are they trying to work? Are they, are they visiting family members? So all of that is taken into consideration when a travel permit is granted. For condition number five, uh, reporting within 72 hours, a change of residence or employment. And we need to know where the offenders are living um, in order to monitor them. So we need to know who they're living with. We need to make sure they're abiding by no contacts, no contact orders. So there is a reason that we um, go out to their homes. Uh, next slide. Condition number six, um, those on probation cannot have access or control of a firearm or deadly weapon. Condition number seven, they um, need to stay away from any um, illegal substances or other dangerous drugs unless prescribed lawfully. And um, drug tests may be uh, a part of, of their supervision. Um, drug use might be tied to criminal behavior um, and might impact negatively any rehabilitative efforts. So, um, Condition number eight about the supervision fee. Again, it's a $200 supervision fee that is going away as of April 3rd, uh, 2022, um, due to the House bill that the governor signed. And condition number nine um, delves into the special conditions imposed. And I want to emphasize that special conditions are ordered by the court. Um, even though the conditions say may be imposed by the supervision officer, the officer still needs to write a report to the court and the judge needs to sign off on that in order for it to be enforceable. For example, if an officer is notified by a concerned family member that a person is using opiates, for example, and the person comes in and the officer drug tests them and the drug test results are positive, we will write to the court if it wasn't part of the original condition of supervision, we will write to the court and ask that a substance abuse evaluation be part of their conditions of supervision. We will explain and articulate to the court as to why we are asking for that condition. And if the court approves it, then it's enforceable. Um, we don't arbitrarily make conditions up. We, we do it with rehabilitation in mind. Next slide. And those conditions are for levels one, two, and three. These conditions 10 through 13 are specific for those who are on level three or high risk. Um, conditions 10 through 12 
um, the purpose is to provide enhanced conditions for pro-social activities and to encourage free time and to encourage employment and education opportunities. I, I just want to say that these conditions are rarely cited in violation reports, and they are never cited as standalone conditions um, that are cited in a violation. And condition number 13 says you must abide by a curfew established. And again, those are who are on high risk do have a standard curfew and generally it's 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. Now, if someone has, um, you know, say works a second shift, those curfew hours can be modified, you know, with ver verification. The officer just needs to have that conversation with the officer and let them know what their working hours are and that the, cur the curfew hours can be adjusted. Next slide. And these are examples of some of the special conditions that, that are imposed, um, anywhere from a no contact order to, to programs, um, evaluations and treatment, um, paying costs and fines, any employment or education that's specific to um, the judge's order. Um, so, and electronic monitoring is also can be a special condition. Next slide. We're going to go over some case studies, um, and um, Heidi's going to be Jane Doe, and I am going to be Matt Smith. So, All right. so let's see. Jane Doe is serving a sentence for drug dealing of two years at level five at DOC discretion, followed by 18 months at level three. Jane is seen by an institutional release officer prior to release from incarceration. She is provided reporting instructions to include the location of the probation office and the assigned supervision officer. Sentence, sentencing and conditions of supervision are issued and reviewed. Jane's court ordered special conditions include complying with treatment in the community. Just one important fact I want the audience to remember as we kind of work through Jane's case study is I want you to remember that this Jane Doe was sentenced to level three probation by the court. Yeah, so we're going to kind of take you through these two case studies, and as we go over um, a certain area, we'll progress uh, these two individuals through our case study. So um, Matt Smith is sentenced to in Superior Court to 18 months level three for robbery second. He reports to his intake officer at the courthouse house after sentencing and is provided with reporting instructions to include location of the probation office and assigned supervision officer. Sentencing and conditions of supervision are issued and reviewed. Matt's court ordered special conditions are no contact with co-defendants, to obtain a GED or high school diploma, and to have no contact in the area where the robbery occurred. All right, so now that we signed up for, for probation, we're going to progress into the supervision. As I described earlier, officers' op roles often change based off of the individual case management, but officers' core supervision activities include in interviewing, assessing each case, conducting home visits, office visits, providing case management, going into doing community visits, making appropriate referrals, attending hearings, and providing assistance, assistance during or at times even after discharge. So not only do their roles change, the activities have to change for each individualized case. So the Department of Correction continues to embrace the most evidence-based strategies for effective supervision. On April 1st, 2022, DOC successfully implemented the Level of Service Risk, Needs, and Responsivity, it's also known as the Ellis r and &R. This is an evidence-based assessment to object, objectively evaluate the offender's risk for recidivism and their rehabilitation supervision and their programming needs. Prior to April 1st, the department used the LSIR to measure recidivism risk until it was phased out as new evidence produced an updated accurate and reliable assessment to measure our recidivism with an instrument to identify that risk needs and responsivity responsivity element. So within 45 days of a case assignment, the LSRNR will be administered to determine the risk and the 
identify the needs for each case to allow the officer to kind of individualize a case management strategy in those eight subject areas noted on the slide. The assessment produces a summary risk that can be categor categorized into three levels, high, medium, and low risk. And as we've gone through the slide, we have mentioned level three, high risk, or level two, moderate risk, level one, low risk. They coincide together with our instrument that we currently use today. So for my data friends, this snapshot provides an overview of the assessments performed in 2022. The chart reflects the number of approved LSIR and LSRNR administrator administered at probation and parole in 2022. Please keep in mind three months include the LSIR data as we transitioned as of April 1st. So in 2022, we had 3,346 assessments. 32% reflected a high risk, 47 reflected a moderate risk, and 21% reflected a low risk. So earlier, I provided some context on the history on probation with key legislation that impact operations. I mentioned about Senate Bill 50 provided probation the authority to change the court ordered level of supervision to address the individual's risk, recidivism risk to the community. So when the court sentences a person to a period of probation, the court will indicate a level of supervision. Upon assessment of the lsr and R, the outcome will provide the supervising officer with a risk score for recidivism. Based on that outcome, the officer may modify the level of supervision imposed by the court to align the results of the lsr and R. For example, a court, the case may be court ordered to level three. Then the lsr and R determines that person, that individual will be successful at level two. As a result, the, the supervising officer can decrease the level of supervision based off of the assessment outcome. And the LSRNR is the primary assessment used at, at probation and parole offices. And, and again, it also assists in determining those risks and the needs for rehabilitation while aligning the appropriate level of supervision. Hi, please. So now that we have the case, assigned and assessed. One core function of supervision is to meet with individuals and have regular discussions on their progress and expectations to address identified risks and needs to reinforce that positive behavior. During each office visit, officers will verify all the pertinent information, compliance, and address or refer cases for reinforced pro-social behaviors. Now at times, the officer may, the officer and the individual may need to discuss that Cowboys poster hanging on the back wall in this picture. You know, some of us Angle, Eagles fans may not appreciate it, but the point is office visits are a time for the officer and the people they supervise to build professional relationship. Probation officers may be the only positive role model in, someone, in someone's life. visits allow officers to review the home for situational awareness and knowledge of the surroundings in law enforcement actions may be warranted. Supportive home environments are critical for officers and those under supervision. It gives, the, it provides an opportunity for the officer to gauge the living situation and connect with the residents in the home while in their living environments. All right, so we're going to jump in. Uh, we've been talking for a little bit now, so we're going to jump in and, and do a poll, see if people are still uh, paying attention. Um, so let me, nope, that's the wrong button. We're going to launch, nope, that's the wrong button. All right, so we just uh, talked about the purpose of home visits, right? Uh, Deputy Chief Collier just reviewed that with us. So we're going to ask a true false question now. And the question is, uh, true or false, you are not permitted to be homeless while on probation. Um, so uh, people want to weigh in, I'll give everybody about a minute, and then we will brief those results. All right, thank you. We have 
a lot of responses coming in. All right, I'll give it another few seconds. Anybody wants to weigh in last minute, true or false, you are not permitted to be homeless uh, while on probation. All right, ending poll and I'll share the results. So the majority of our respondents uh, indicated that, um, oh, I've now confused myself with the true or false question. You are not permitted to be, you are not permitted. To, that is false, yes. So seven, seven these true or false questions. So it's been a long time since we've done this. You have to excuse me. So yes, it is false, right? That you are not permitted to be homeless while on probation. Um, and 77% of you um, indicated that you believed it was false. And, and we asked this, right? Because it's a common misconception, right? So Director Kearney, can you talk to us a little bit about, you know, how that comes to be maybe a common misconception and what someone should do if they find themselves um, without a place to live while they're on probation or if there's like specific circumstances where you are required to, um, you know, to have some place specific to live. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Sure. So if a person is homeless, we just require them to keep in communication with their officer because again we need to know where they're residing um so if they are staying at multiple locations we just ask that you notify your officer as to where you're laying your head um at the same time the officer can refer them to any kind of temporary housing um, I talked about the in-reach coordinators um, that go into the facilities, but they are located at each district office and serve as a resource for the officers. So the in-reach coordinators can help with, with, with housing, temporary housing. Um, a person who is on home confinement, it would be a problem for them to be homeless on home confinement. Um, however, you know, we look at, and, and I'll get into this a little bit more about, about having a host on a level four home confinement, someone that kind of sponsors their residents. And, it, um, you know, we would look at other options. If, if this person can't be a host, maybe we can, we can explore alternatives or um, level four home confinement and level four work release are the same level of supervision. So work release may be an option for a person that's homeless. Thank you very much. All right, I think we're gonna move now to the next slide, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there we go. So as I mentioned earlier, legislation permitted the Delaware Department of Corrections to introduce graduated responses for compliant and non-compliant behaviors using incentives and sanctions. So graduated responses gives officers tools to address behavior without the requirement to inform the court of a violation and reward individuals who demonstrate good character. So in this graph, you'll see a number of graduated responses for compliance from 2018 to 2022. Each of these responses represent an event where someone was rewarded with one or more, re rewarded with one or more conditions of supervision. Some of our incentives may include, you know, verbal recognition, reduce curfew, uh, reduce reporting instructions, possibility of earned compliance credit discharge, or a early release recommendation to the court. And this graph represents the number of graduated responses for non-compliance. Each of these responses represents a possible opportunity to file a violation report with the sentencing, violation report with the sentencing court. However, the supervising officer addressed the non-compliant behavior administratively with a sanction. Some of these sanctions include maybe a verbal warning, uh, increased curfew, uh, increased reporting, a request to the court for a special condition, or perhaps what we have is called an administrative commitment. With administrative commitments, they are required to go through a review process by a supervisor and a reviewer to evaluate the severity of noncompliance for each case before it is approved for an administrative commitment. New arrests, new criminal arrests or offenses during the term of supervision excludes officers from issuing a graduated sanction 
Also, individuals who abscond from probation will be subject to a violation of probation versus actually receiving a graduated response. Next slide, please. So now that we've discussed probation supervision activities, we're gonna revisit Jane Doe and Matt Smith and bring you up to date on how they're making out. So Jane reports to probation and completes the and completes the Ellis r and risk needs assessment. Jane scores moderate risk and flows to level two. And earlier I mentioned to rem remember the fact that the court actually ordered her to level three, but her, in this case, her assessment determined that level two would be most appropriate for her supervision based off of her assessment results and we flowed her to level two. So Jane meets her officer, provides her address information and other required document and is referred to treatment. Jane finds employment, reports as required, submits, negative, submits a negative urine screen and is assessed by the treatment provider. No treatment is recommended and Jane is given a graduated response for compliance with reduced reporting requirements. All right, and Matt Smith, he reports to his probation and completes an LSR and R risk needs assessment. He scores high risk and remains at level three. He meets with his officer, provides his address and other required information, and is referred for case management and employment and education services, we'll say to DCJ, because they are in-house, an in-house program. Matt's officer is unable to verify his address, and the resident states that no one lives here there by, by that name. Matt reports inconsistently without employment and missed two curfew checks. Matt is given a graduated sanction of an increased curfew to validate where he is living. Slide, please. All right, so in this section, we are going to be talking about how probation and parole interacts and engages with the community. And each year, probation and parole honors our communities by participating in organized events, group initiatives to really make a difference in our state. So in this section, we will showcase a few examples of probation and parole kind of going above and beyond the call of duty to support the mission, plus how probation and parole partners with our agencies to support our efforts. So each district office throughout the state offers services to help and connect individuals with resources and services. Probation and parole partners with, like Director Kearney just mentioned, the Delaware Center for Justice for Case Management and Job Programs. We have contracted services for sexual disorders treatment, substance abuse, mental health evaluation, substance abuse aftercare. And there's many other partners that are shown on this slide that probation and parole partners with in each of our district offices. And protecting our community. One event probation and parole participate in participates in each year is our annual Halloween curfew project. And each Halloween night, the DOC imposes special restrictions on our high-risk sex offenders and those with child victims under probation and parole supervision. Restrictions required include remaining inside their home with the lights turned off at 6 p.m., prohibiting them from distributing candy, um, participating in Halloween-related activities, or displaying Halloween decorations. Homeless sex offenders on the, under the Department of Correction supervision must report to a local probation office or other location at 5.30 p.m. Will they will remain until 9 p.m. And to ensure compliance with these restrictions and support public safety during our trick-or-treating activities, we have teams of probation and parole officers deploy across the state to conduct home checks at their designated residence. Halloween 2022 probation officer record 414 positive contacts. There were 19 homeless sex offenders that reported to their district office with no arrest. We had 10 graduated responses with four violation reports actually issued in the statewide. Along with protecting our community, we also are supporting our community. Probation officers statewide continuously participate in several events to support our communities from attending resource events to public forums and collecting food throughout the year. 2022, the Delaware State News published an article kind of showcasing an example of probation parole officers selflessly devoting their time to engage and connect with the public and promote a positive relationship through networking. And this is an example on this slide.
giving back to our community. Uh, probation parole understands that partnership and collaboration are the building blocks of positive relationships. Each year, our probation and parole officers kind of go that extra mile with their contributions to our community. So here's an example in April, 2022, the Cape Gazette published an article highlighting volunteer initiative organized by probation and parole officers. In November, 2022, just a few months ago, um, the team furthered their goal by collecting over 400 coats, over 500 winter clothing items. Um, the collection actually supported 10 community service agencies in all three counties. So probation and parole officers volunteer their time to give back to our community to build trust by serving those with needs. And throughout the year, you can often hear some of those heartfelt stories of our officers um, con contributing to uh, clothing drives, fundraising for local shelters, or collecting donations for Christmas. And again, the leadership team recognizes the officer's dedication to go above and beyond to help our communities and really recognize the importance of the work that they perform each day. All right, I'm gonna go over the caseload specializations and task forces. And we talked about some of them, but um, I'll, I'll break it down a little bit in more detail. Um, so there's specialized units across the state, um, DUI court, mental health court, reentry court, and veterans court all have assigned judges with frequent status hearings. So there's one assigned, one or two assigned officers who report to a specific judge to get updates on how the participant is doing. Um, those engaged, they, we provide wraparound services and support. Uh, Reentry works closely with the Achievement Center and Veterans Court works closely with the VA Center and programs. Then there's electronic monitoring and there are, there's GPS monitoring there's home confinement monitoring and there's alcohol monitoring and I'll go over them in the next slide or the next few slides. Um, so individuals can be assigned to a specialized unit or a standard unit and also be ordered to some kind of electronic monitoring any of those three that I listed. And we have R2R Aftercare, which is the road to recovery. It previously was the Key Crest program. So it's part of a substance abuse continuum. So someone um, does the program inside of the facility, whether it be a level four or five facility, they come out and there's a continuum of, of the curriculum that goes along with that. Um, and there are aftercare counselors that work closely with the probation officers. They provide case management services and they are in-house as well. The domestic violence unit, um, they identify cases uh, based on the crime or the relationship that between uh, the relationship to the victim. The, um, they use a different assessment tool other than the LSR and R. They use what's called the DVSIR, the Domestic Violence Screening Instrument Revised, which focuses more on the domestic violence history, behavior change, accountability, and victim safety. And victim outreach is also part of the DV supervision. We also have sex offenders, and that's those who are convicted of a sex offense or those who are registered as a sex offender. They work closely with the in-house sex offender treatment program. The monitoring may include polygraphs and, main, and maintaining no contact orders, especially with children. They use both the stable and the static 99 as assessments for this population, and all tier three sex offenders are mandated by statute to be placed on GPS. Wait, one more. <laughs> we have the group violence um, intervention or GVI of Delaware. And now this started in the city of Wilmington in 2019 and the program was successful and it was replicated in the city of Dover in 2022. The GVI program involves collaboration with law enforcement, GVI services, adult and juvenile probation. What happens is um, high-risk groups are identified that are prone to violence. The GVI team assists with keeping participants safe, stabilizing their lives, and creating accountability with enforcement actions as needed. The program targets issues, issues such as poverty, angry, anger, <laughs> and hopelessness through interventions and encourages a change from the street life. Okay. 
pretrial supervision. Again, we talked about this already. Pretrial supervision is under the umbrella of probation and parole. Pretrial is essentially monitoring before the person is found or pled or pleads guilty to a criminal offense. It's ordered as a condition of a person's bail, or it can be it could be set at the time of uh, presentment, or it could be ordered any time throughout a uh, pending case. It's an alternative to pretrial detention. So either a person is held um, in incarceration or they can be out in the community supervised on pretrial. These individuals are monitored until there's a disposition on the pending charges. And you can see there are less conditions for a pretrial person than there are for someone who is convicted. And they have more rights than someone who is convicted because they have not yet been convicted. Um, if a person on pretrial is non-compliant, a breach of release is filed and the court is notified of their non-compliance. Yes, I think well, I have a little poll here. Um, and I think that this has been mentioned a few times, so maybe we'll kind of be, you know, if people have been paying attention, but the question we're going to ask now is related to pretrial supervision and related specifically to uh, the population. And the question uh, is, is the use of pretrial supervision as a condition of release by the courts has increased or decreased over the last several years. So I will give everyone a few seconds to um, weigh in and then we will share the results. Seconds. Right. Our results, and it looks like 81% of our attendees who weighed in believe that the pretrial supervision population has increased over the last several years. Uh, Dr. Kearney, can you tell us if that is the correct answer? If you go to the next slide, I will tell you that that is the correct answer. So this slide demonstrates at the end of each year what the pretrial numbers are were at that time. Um, as you can see, there was a spike uh, and went up in December of 20 uh, and December of 21. And part of that was due to COVID uh, because charges weren't being put through the system because the court kind of shut down. So um, that's part of the reason why there was a spike in, in, in 2020 and 2021. Also, the um, the, pre, the Bail Reform Act, um, which reduced the those who were um, incarcerated pretrial and put more people out in the community on pretrial supervision. Um, electronic monitoring, again, I'll go over them. Um, home confinement, again, they're restricted to their home. They have to have a host. Um, they can host themselves. They wear an ankle bracelet. And they are allowed out of their residence for certain pro-social behaviors, such as work, uh, going to counseling, visiting their probation officers. Um, alcohol monitoring, uh, it, it, we have the system that we use right now is called Soberlink um, or the SL3. And it's a device where they randomly are called and they are notified to blow into a device to make sure that they're not they're abstaining from drinking. And um, that's, that's a lot part of the uh, felony DUI statute where we have to monitor people for um, sobriety for 90 days. Um, and then GPS is a 24 hour monitoring. So um, a person is, can like we, you can kind of trace the dots and see where they are at, at all times. It's a real time monitoring system. Again, like I said, all, all tier three sex offenders are mandated to be on GPS. Um, GPS can set up exclusion zones. So 
if say there's a high risk domestic violence case where um, there's a victim that we're concerned about, we can set up exclusion zones around her residence or her residence or employment. And then there's an alert that goes off if they come within that, that perimeter. Electronic monitoring officers are on call and there's a 24 hour monitoring center. So if anything happens with their equipment, um, they troubleshoot, um, if the, somebody cuts off their ankle bracelet, they're notified immediately. So there's an immediate response to those who are on electronic monitoring. Next slide. Let's jump in with another poll real quick. Okay. Um, so we're going to move on and we're going to do oh, a little extra. We're going to talk about um, some other special circumstances that people might encounter while they're on probation. Um, so let's ask a question um, about your state, right? We're going to talk about that next and we'll touch on it a couple of times. So the question is, right, if a person wants to serve their probation from a state other than uh, where they were sentenced, uh, who can approve that transfer? Uh, would it be A, the judge, uh, B, the probation parole officer, C, the probationer, or D, um, the sending and receiving state uh, based on the federal interstate contact agreement? So I will give everyone a moment to kind of weigh in on that one, and then uh, we will read the results. a few seconds while people finish putting in their answer. Here we go, ending the poll. So Director Kearney, 80% of our respondents indicated that uh, the sending and receiving state is um, the body that can approve uh, probation transfer from one state to another based on the federal interstate contact agreement. Um, is that, did I share the results? Oh, sorry. There you go. You can see them now. 80% um, voted that it was the sending and the receiving state. Uh, can you talk to us a little bit about that process and whether or not um, our guesses here are correct? Yes, that's absolutely correct. And if you want to go to the next slide, it talks about the interstate compact. So we are part of the interstate compact. Um, it's their federal guidelines for transferring individuals to and from other states. So um, a judge cannot order someone to be supervised in another state. And we often have to remind the courts of this because it's misleading when they say that a person can 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 move because it depends. Um, it depends on the acceptance of, of the other state. There's a transfer process that's based on the crime and it ties to the individual and if they have ties to that other state. So we have cases assigned in Delaware that are from other states and, and, and vice versa. There are both mandatory and discretionary transfers and each state has a compact office which allows communication. So um, Next slide. Oh, yeah, this was good. Um, there is a $50 interstate fee that that uh, people have to pay before the, the paperwork starts to transfer a case. Um, it is much higher in many other states. Um, they agree at that time when they transfer to abide by the conditions of both the sending and the receiving state. And at that time, when they, uh, the, when they do the transfer, they waive their right to extradition. Next slide. Community service and work referral. We have a community service uh, coordinator, which helps individuals connect with programs to complete community service hours. And this could be ordered by the court. Um, if someone has costs and fines to pay, a judge can order work referral or a probation officer can recommend a work referral. If, if um, you know, they're having trouble paying their fines, we can, we can refer them to this program. So it's just a way to, to help um, ease the, bur the financial burdens. And victim advocates. Um, we have victim services providers within each county. 
and uh, they assist victims with understanding the criminal justice system with counseling service referrals. Uh, they refer them to such programs as the Vine Link, which gives notification of somebody's upcoming release and provides court accompaniments, advocacy, and guidance to assist with safety planning. They also serve as a resource for probation and parole officers. Next slide. Uh, the, other, the other part of our jobs is enforcement. So we do have task forces that where PNP officers work with local and federal partners to support our mission. So we work with the Delaware State Police, Wilmington County, Dover. We work with the federal um, the FBI, the U.S. Marshal Service, and with the DEA. Next. Okay, so task force officers don't have caseloads. Um, caseloads, but they support the supervision officers uh, with enhancements that are listed on this slide, the curfew checks, the community visits, the community engagement, surveillance, that sort of thing. Um, the task force officers do do curfew checks, and they conducted 8,707 curfew checks in 2022 and had a 65% uh, rate of compliance for curfews. Next slide. Um, the task force officers have, have done a great job in um, taking a lot of firearms off the street, as you can see by these statistics. Um, so these are the numbers uh, for the past three years of, of firearms that have, have been seized working with our police partners. All right, we're gonna do another case study. Heidi, you're on mute. Yep. We're gonna get another case study and do an update to what we've learned so far. So Jane has continued to report and has completed her court ordered requirements. Jane has struggled to pay her financial obligations. So her PO submits a request for work, work referral to apply her costs and fines. And Matt continues to miss curfews and reports sporadically. He's not engaged with the case management provider or any education or employment services. Task force members have advised Matt's probation officer that he's been seen with co-defendants and has been returning to the area where he has a no contact order. All right, now that we discussed many topics, let's finish up with getting off probation. Slide. So this section reflects the various discharges applicable based off of the individual scenarios. So maximum expiration date or known as MED, early discharge or we call it ED. Progress reports are submitted to the court by their assigned officer at the end of the probation term requesting dis discharge from probation. Or the court can discharge a, at a hearing based, off, based on the VOP for a technical violation or new criminal charges through the revocation and either ends the term of supervision or may impose a new sentence. Also, earn compliance credit discharge, ECC, we brought up earlier when we were discussing legislation. Based off compliance, our system prompts those cases that are eligible for an earn compliance credit to generate a notice to the court that the probation will be closing the case out due to compliance. Certain offenses excluded are those that involve any sort of public safety or concern for an identified victim. So back to our case study. Jane Doe continues to be compliant and has maintained verified employment and is seeking custody of her children through family court. The probation office continues to support her efforts. Matt Smith is, isn't doing so well. So he, Matt got arrested for assault first in possession of a deadly weapon during a commission during the commission of a felony. Slide, please. All right, violation of probation reports have two purposes. Um, first, the officer will notify the sentencing authority of an alleged violation of the conditions of supervision. Officers document the supervision activities re recorded in case notes. This includes office visits, home visits 
drug and alcohol testing, treatment provider follow-up, criminal history checks, financial ob obligation monitoring, et cetera. The officers have a record of information to present at the violation of probation hearing to help the court decide on the outcome. Number two is the the recommend an appropriate disposition for the case. So the supervising officer is enforcing a court order and is responsible for monitoring and documenting an individual's activities. The sentencing authority will rely heavily on the officer to make an appropriate disposition that balances the needs case, the public and the victim. But only the sentencing authority can determine whether a violation has occurred. If it is determined that a violation has occurred, the sentencing authority decides the appropriate disposition, outcome, and the sentence. Slide, please. So probation officers have three ways they can request for service. Uh, the probation officer may start with or may st request a summons for cases that report as required and is not a risk to self or others. The officer can also request a capius when the individual under supervision may stops, stops reporting and PMP notifies the court of a violation and, and attempts have been documented to obtain that compliance. Or the officer may issue an administrative warrant for an immediate arrest when a person poses a risk to the community, identified victim or self. And an administrative warrant is a commitment the arrest is immediate and the person is transported to the court of jurisdiction for capers return for the court to impose bail until the VOP proceedings. Now, if the court is not open, that person is then taken into custody and will be held as a detentioner until the court schedules the capious return. Bail is set pending the VOP, VOP proceeding and scheduled by the court. And the court has the authority to revoke and impose new sentences. So we're gonna kind of discuss next in our next slide. During the VOP hearing, the, the PMP officer or and the defendant will appear before the sentencing authority in court, and the officer will present the alleged violations of conditions of supervision, the supervision history, and a recommendation. The court will decide if the violation is founded, revoke the sentence, and impose a new term. Generally, a condition of generally a violation of one level of supervision will result in an increase to the next level of supervision based on the totality of the case. If there are public safety concerns, the court may impose a period of level four quasi-incarceration or level five period of incarceration. The court also may reimpose ordered, previously ordered conditions or add special conditions based on, again, the totalities and the facts of the violation. For example, if an individual is serving probation for a domestic violence related offense with a special condition with a no unlawful contact against the victim, and that individual violates the probation due to new domestic violence charges against that same victim, the court may impose a no contact with that victim. So let's see, let's review our case studies how they progress through their probation term. So Jane has four months left on her probation. However, she is in full compliance. She, Jane, off, Jane's officer writes to the court and requesting, requesting an early discharge. So the court approves the early discharge and Jane is now off probation. All right, and in Matt's case, the officer submits a violation report citing the technical violations and his non-reporting and not, and being where he's not supposed to be, along with the new charges. He's held in default of bail for several months pending the new charges and the violation hearing. Matt eventually goes to court and is sentenced on the new charges to four years of incarceration, suspended after three years for six months at level four DOC discretion, followed by 18 months level three probation. The court discharges Matt's violation of probation during sentencing for the new offenses. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I hear that my audio might be a little wonky. Is it still sounding wonky? Just a little bit. I Sound like you're a robot. Me. I thought it was me. Here's what I'm going to try to do. I'm going to try to switch computers and get webinar, right? And see how talented I am. So hold on one second.
Okay. Can you hear me? Oh, hold on. Can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. Is it better? Yes. Okay. All right. So now uh, I appear to be in the beginning of the webinar. Yeah, if you could take us back to slide 59, that would be great. Okay, you're on mute, Heather. Heather, you're on mute. Wait, so I'm, you couldn't hear me all the time? No, no, no ma'am. <laughs> all right, so the, the poll is out. People are answering. Um, I am gonna end it now. You can hear me now, right? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, okay. So one more second. A few more people are weighing in. ending poll and sharing results. So in 2022, um, we asked a question approximately what percentage of submitted probation violations included a citation for a new criminal offense. And we had 53% um, said they believed that, that um, approximately 33 of the violations included a citation for a new criminal offense. Um, with coming in second, 35% um, said that they believed that 50% of the violation reports included a citation for a new criminal offense. So um, Missy or Heidi, could one of you um, tell us what the correct answer is? I'm going to stop sharing. Sure thing. If you I never shared the results. There. No, I did. Stop sharing. I'm going to put that down. So if you could take us to the next slide, we'll get the results for that on our data chart. A little too far. There we go. All right. Now we worked out all the kinks, hopefully. So the department is office often asked to provide stats around in the probation conditions. And in this chart, you'll find the data collected between 2018 and 2022, providing the percentage of percentages for each condition. And those that reported to that question, if we had 50, it was 50% for condition one are reported in our stats. So the three most commonly cited conditions in VOP reports are condition one, which are new charges related to the commission of new criminal and or motor vehicle offenses during the period of supervision. Condition three, which is associated with the failure to report to the probation parole office as directed 
Typically what we'll find in condition three are those that are absconding from, prob from probation. And then our condition nine, which is related to the failure to abide by one or more special conditions. And there are many incident instances where multiple conditions are cited within the violation report. An example could be someone who moved from their residence, not reported to their officer within 72 hours, or has failed to report regularly for their scheduled office visits, and now has a new arrest for criminal offenses during that supervision period. That person could be cited for a condition one related to the new charge, condition three to failure to report as directed, condition five failing to report the change of a residence within the 72 hour time frame. Or if you utilize the case study that Director Kearney went through with Matt Smith's scenario, where he violated multiple conditions during that supervision. And in previous slides, I want to kind of talk back to where Director Kearney reviewed the conditions of supervision and noted uh, conditions 10 through 13 are, are those enhanced conditions for high risk populations and are rarely cited in, in violation of probation reports. You can kind of see what she was alluding to in this report, 0 0.08, 0 0.39, 0 0.16. So those conditions are very, very rarely cited or if they are cited, they're in conjunction with one of those new charges or absconding or maybe a possession of controlled substance. But there's varying factors when you look at the overall stats for our conditions of supervision violations. Right, please. All right, so this is gonna be our last slide. It's a little lengthy, but I wanted to kind of touch base on from our, fir our first discussion when we were discussing the history, now we're going to kind of move probation and parole and how we continue to adapt progressive strategies and update our practices to promote public safety and provide those pro-social services. Apparently we're still having some, oh, there we go. Those pro-social services. So for example, SB 226 changed law to reduce the term to reduce terms and provide internal sanctions for technical violation, concurrent and consecutive sentence. Recently, House Bill 244 passed, removing the supervision fee to be assessed effective April 3rd, 2023, and it's lifting a financial burden. COVID-19, you know, it impacted the nation as a whole, and it pushed agencies to adopt practices for social distancing. And as a result, probation and parole kind of modified their reporting requirements for individuals under supervision. Plus recently expanding office hours to allow for later reporting times if needed. Governor's initiatives to build the Delaware Correctional Reentry Commission, the DCRC, to increase our rehabilitation efforts to assist those from incarceration to reacclimate to our community. As a result, the transition accountability plan was adopted in, in the DOC in 2021, which develops intervention targeted, targeted to criminal behaviors and attitudes and, util, and used to identify risk and needs. And as Director Kearney mentioned earlier, the GVI initiative successfully in, expanded to Kent County in 2022. So as we continue to learn and grow from evidence-based practices by adopting, by adopting the LSRNR in 2022 to increase our ability to identify the risk and needs, We've implemented effective practices in community supervision, also known as the EPICS model, to that assists probation and parole officers, which is designed to use a combination of monitoring, referrals, face-to-face -face interactions to provide individuals with sufficient intervention and develop a collaborative working relationship. More recently, probation and parole transitioned to a hybrid caseload model. And what that means is previously, officers were assigned a specific level caseload. So if you were a level two officer, you had only individuals under level two supervision. Same with level three. If you were level three, you only had level three. So those under supervision would change officers based on their level assignment. So effective January, 2023, now, individuals assigned to, a probate, to probation and assessed as a level two or level three would remain now with that same officer. Moving to this model, it allows officers to maintain and establish rapport 
with individuals under supervision. Like for example, in Jane Doe's situation, she moved from level three to level two supervision during, during her case study. She would have transferred probation officers on the previous model, but now under the new model, Jane Doe would remain with the same probation officer between the level three and the level two. And this strategy will provide more consistency in the supervision of the assigned officers and enhance that report that rapport that's been built during the term of supervision. Probation officer's unique and critical role is to balance the approach of the needs of each individual under their supervision by engaging their success, monitoring their, their behaviors for public safety. Probation officers must customize supervision strategies with every person under their supervision with the tools, resources, and assistance from our community partnerships. And our goal for this presentation is to help educate you and the community about our progressive measures and the ded and dedication at dedicated efforts from our officers to kind of promote that rehabilitation and maintain public safety and ultimately your safety. But naturally we cannot tackle this alone. Uh, we value the input from the community. So I wanna thank you for taking the time to join us tonight, listening and learning about probation and parole today. I'm gonna to go ahead and pass the mic over to Chief Wicker to kind of get us wrapped up. All right. All right. Mm -hmm. Heather, if you want to put up the slides, I can go over um, some of the things we're doing in the community. So, so go ahead. Not as easy to jump from one computer to the other as I thought it was going to be, but can can you hear me? Okay. Yes. You can hear me. All right. So that concludes our presentation. Um, thank you. And now I don't even know where to look, right? Um, so thank you so much to um, Deputy Bureau Chief Collier and Director Kearney, Kearney for um uh, joining us this evening and providing all of this valuable information on your screen right now. Um, we wanted to provide you with some additional information for um, email addresses um, and phone numbers for different DUC teams um, who can help with um, other questions that you might have. We have our reentry mailbox. We have our victim services mailbox, including the victim services um, advocates phone numbers and our community relations um, mailbox available here for you. Um, if you have a question um, about a specific individual, like I said, we can't answer that question um, on the webinar, um, but you can um, contact, use the community relations box to contact and they will direct you to um, kind of the appropriate person to answer your question. As I kind of said in the beginning, though, please keep in mind um, that um, we can't release certain personal um, or health related information on individuals in our custody or under our supervision. So if you do reach out to a member of our team to inquire about someone, they are gonna ask you about your relationship to the person to ensure that we have any prop necessary releases on file before we answer any questions. Um, so we have that information for you. Um, also, um, like take this time to let you know that if you wanna learn more about DOC and how you or you and your organization um, or your company can work with the department to support reentry success. We have a couple of different things available right now, right? So we have um, still have seats available in the spring um, 2023 Citizens Academy. Um, it's a free six week academy that begins on April 18th. Application deadline is March 31st. And if you have any questions about the Citizens Academy, um, you can contact the Chief of uh, Communications and Community Relations, Jason Miller, and his information is at the bottom of the slide that you're looking at right now. Um, and we also have available um, for our um, younger people who might be interested in learning more about DOC or about a career in DOC. We also have um, the department's Summer Youth Academy. Um, that is for people ages 10 to 17. There's two different um, groups based on your 
your age and application deadline for that is on uh, May 12th. You can get more information um, and applications for both of those programs on the Department of Corrections website under the Community Relations tab. And additionally, you can go to our YouTube uh, channel and, and to our socials, and you can view videos um, from previous Citizens Academy, previous um, Youth Academy, um, if you want to to get more information. So we have, you know, a, a couple different ways um, for you to get more involved and learn more things about um, DOC coming up. All right, so here we go, switch here. Um, again, um, this is season two. This is part one of season two, which apparently, um, you know, has, has gone logistically wonderful. Um, but keep, keep an eye out for um, um, our next webinar. We're gonna offer a two-part kind of day in the life series highlighting the variety of positions um, that work within DOC facilities. So keep an eye out for that. Um, if you're on today, you're added kind of to our um, email distribution list. And as, as always, just keep an eye out on our socials for, for announcements. And I think now we will move on to, is there anything else that I, so I normally would launch a poll to ask you how, how, how you all thought this went, but that would require, that's gonna require me to do like 12 different things with this computer. So let's skip it. In the interest of time, in the interest of getting some questions answered, we're going to skip the last poll and we're going to say that everybody thought that this was fantastic and that we managed um, all of these technical difficulties like pros and we're just going to go with that um, and move on to the Q&A portion. So we had um, quite a few questions kind of posed and I'm sorry I'm going to be looking in like two different directions because the I got questions in two different places, but let's start with... Um, Let's start with an easy question, okay? So a question that was kind of, that was posed early on was, um, are probation and parole officers um, in the state of Delaware covered under the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights Act? Yes, is the answer. Yes, <laughs> yes they're covered and they are um, part of a, a union too, so. So the issue becomes is that I can't hear your answers. So I don't know what you're saying. So here is what, I don't know how to solve this. Let's ditch the PowerPoint. Any chance that my, um, audio issues from this one is better. No. All right. Just gonna sound so good. Just bear with me. So let's see, one of the, let's see. <laughs> so there was a question. Oh. There was a question um, that asked, is it true that a probationer will need to stay at their scoring level for a minimum of three months before being able to be tested again to change their supervision level? So this question came in when we were talking about um, the LSRNR and how it kind of impacts your supervision level. Um, you, you talked about how within 45 days of um, assignment to probation that you have this assessment. So the question I think is then about, um, you know, say you, you, your original score is, is, is to high risk and you're on your supervised at that level of probation, when and where are the opportunities to, to flow down? Yeah. So a person can be reclassified, um, after, a six month period of supervision. And it gets a little bit complicated because syntax still exists when we're still assessing people. So a person can be sentenced on a violation and say they're assessed at level two and they violate their probation. Then they go up to the next highest level for that 90 day period. And then they go back to their assessed level. It's a little complicated because both systems are in use, both Syntac and the uh, Senate Bill 50, which changed how we supervise people. So I don't know if I answered that, but. Okay, I 
I think so. Thank you. So, um, oh, do I have? I have to turn off one speaker before I turn on the other yeah. one. All right. I hear. Oh, I'm doing it again. again. Okay. So, next question um, is a question. Um, so, the question is Do you have any data on how um, accurate the LSRNR approvals are over time? And I guess maybe I'll take a, I guess I'll take a crack at this one um, mm -hmm. to, to start. So, as I think, um, I don't remember, I think it might have been uh, Deputy Bureau Chief Collier had indicated. During the presentation, we moved to the um, from the LSIR, which we had done for decades, right, um, to the LSRNR back in April of 2022, and that was um, a function of the um, uh, you know of the developer of these tools, kind of you know research moving on and them kind of developing a, a more robust tool that they were going to support. So um, LSIR kind of retired, LSRNR came in, we trained staff and we rolled out. Directly prior to that happening, we had actually undertaken a, a, a validation study of the LSIR, which you do peri periodically with these risk and needs assessments. And we had um, uh, an organization come in and take a look at the LSIR and and help us determine whether or not you know kind of one is was the assessment um, predicting uh, what it was um, you know designated to predict right and then two were we are we um, administering that that tool with fidelity right so are we using the tool in the, in the way in which it was designed to be um, used and the the results of that study was that yes that the, the tool was predicting risk and needs of recidivism the way that it was supposed to and that we were using it the way that it was supposed to and kind of while we had them there we knew we were making the switch over so we said hey can we can we look at kind of pre-validating the ls r and r so we're moving towards this new tool. Can you take a look at our data um, from the LSIR and kind of run it through and see if the LSRNR um, looks like it will be a, a predictable a predictable tool for for Delaware also? And they did that, right? And and it, you know, it kind of it was a determined fit. So we moved forward. So it's too soon, right? So if the question is, is the LSRNR valid? It's kind of too soon for us to undertake a, 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 a larger validity study um, because we only have, we barely have, not even, right? Not even 12 oh, months worth April. of data yet. Right. But we are, we have been kind of in a lot of conversations internally about, you know, are we administering it correctly? Um, is the, is, um, you know, has, has the staff have the training that they need to administer, to feel confident in administering it? And, you know, what, quality improvement things can we kind of put in place to, to make sure that all of these things are happening in between studies. So long uh, answer short, the, the tool that we were using, the LSIR, um, had been validated right before um, we switched over and we kind of did a pre-validity with the LSRNR, but we will undertake um, validity studies as appropriate for the LSRNR as time goes on. So I think I took that one. Um, um, and I don't know why it pops my other um, audio back on, but one for you guys. What does DOC do to support people um, transitioning back to the community as far as housing is concerned? Um, housing is a big issue in Delaware. And, um, you know, we work the best we can with finding resources for housing. Um, it's a challenge to DOC, just like it's a challenge for nonprofit agencies to find housing. But um, I think the in-reach coordinators do a good job at trying to find resources for people who need housing. Um, I'll jump in to kind of state our partnerships with some of our local shelters. You know, we've maintained a lot of partnerships throughout the years, and I know how to Chiefs Wickers unit, they've received grant funding in the past to pay for hotel vouchers and grant funding to kind of support that initial initiative while we're trying to work with our partnership. But like to Director Kearney's point is it, it is very tough right now, especially, I mean, it's tough right now for someone that has a full-time job making $20 an hour to find affordable housing. And that's where we're at in the state. So we have to be very strategic and work together, work with our partnerships and that's why we like to bring folks together to, to the table to kind of discuss some of these things, because if there's resources out there, we'd like to hear about them. All 
All right, thank you for that. And I'm not sure as I was un, as I was muting and unmuting, um, if if anyone mentioned we also have um, you know our contracted um, uh, behavioral health provider also has um, uh, reentry coaches embedded in our facilities who also assist with um, transitional housing options for um, people in our custody who kind of fall under the those with like substance use disorder or with mental health disorders or with chronic care conditions. So we, you know, we do, we leverage kind of our partnerships with, um, you know, community partners, other state agencies, our contracted partners um, to, to, make sure that we have, um, you know, that we can identify the as many resources as possible as far as housing is concerned. Um, so let's see, the next question. Um, so there's a question about measuring success rates of GVI. And I don't know if there's been any, um, at, at this point, if there's been any kind of, um, you know, it hasn't been around super long, right? So um, I don't know if there's been any kind of look at outcomes for that or not. I don't know if you guys can can speak to that at all. And I, I don't know if Sam Ford is on this call, but he, he'd probably love to answer. <laughs> um, there, there have not been any studies. However, there has been a reduction in gun violence related to these groups but we can't necessarily attribute it to the GVI um, services. Um, I, they do what's called a call-in, which is very impactful. They bring these identified groups together and, and they talk to them about how they can love and support them. Um, but, and they also have the enforcement side that says, you know, you can, if you don't put down the guns, you are going to be subjected to the enforcement part of that. So I don't know if we can say there's a direct correlation, but we can say that it's been impactful. Okay. And you know, maybe eventually we can see individuals who come out of the GVI program who end up turning their lives around. And I'll just reiterate to that last year, I mean, we are collecting data, it's still in its infancy, and we're going to continue to collect a lot of data surrounding the GBI initiative. But for last year, group involved shootings are down. Now, to Director Kearney's point, that GBI was kicked off in full force. So I'd like to say our GBI partners are probably had a huge impact on why those numbers were, were down last year. And even if someone trips up and if somebody gets locked up, the GVI services, they go in and they visit the, the and visit them while they're in custody and, and, you know, they don't give up on them. So there's really um, a great relationship with GVI services and, and the people who are, who agree to participate. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you so much. Do we has I don't know if this is I don't know if this has happened or not, or if you know if this has happened or not, but has um, has GVI published any reports that they've made public or anything like that that we might be able to refer people to? Uh, let me get back to you on that. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't sure. Um, all right. So let's. Oh, oh. I do believe there's a website though for GVI. Yeah. So let's see, we have, um, I mean, I can pull up statistics on how many people are engaged at this point in time, if, if that's the information that's being sought. No, I think it was just kind of, you know, like a general, how are they measuring success? And I think that the, the answer is, is that it's, it's an, it's a new program and we're kind of, you know, we're looking at lower rates of group inv group involved shootings. And I think that, um, you know, also maybe kind of like the, the success of the, the, the call-ins because GVI is, it's correct me if I'm wrong, GVI is voluntary, right? Like there's, right. Right? right. So people who, who are participating are voluntarily participating. So I think that if, if we're looking at the numbers of people who are voluntarily participating, I think that you could probably talk about that success there also. Um, but I think maybe probably the overall answer is, is, is to be determined. Yes. 
Okay, so let's see. Um, there's a question about um, pretrial supervision um, numbers not returning to pre-pandemic levels. So factors that might be impacting that. And I think um, I think that we touched on it a little bit about how um, th there's a variety of things, right, that um, that cause the kind of increase of of the pre-trial supervision numbers and are kind of keeping the, while it's going down a little, right, it's not going back to those uh, back in the day numbers. Do you guys want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, okay. And so I think that the reason for that is because of the bail reform that we talked about. So they're, um, they're doing assessments and deciding what the best um, conditions of, of release are for individuals. So I think that has led to less people incarcerated as detentioners and more people being placed on supervision pending the outcome of their hearings. So I think it's directly correlated to, to uh, bail reform. And COVID-19 definitely impacted a lot of our operations um, at our level five facilities for for quite some time, our pretrial population was higher than our sentence population. So we are still dealing with remnants of COVID-19 where the courts were shut down for a significant amount of time. And we still have a quite a backlog too with pretrial cases. Yeah, and I would agree, Heidi, with, with the, uh, can you hear me? Uh, you little, Difficult. Um, you know, there are still cases where people are staying on pretrial longer, uh, pretrial supervision a lot longer than they have in the past, right? Because cases have, um, you know, cases are staying in the system for a lot longer than they have because the courts were, um, you know, not functioning at, at normal levels for such a significant period of time. And there was another question um, very early on about um, the increases in the probation and parole population during in these groups. And, you know, as we were kind of doing this, I was pulling up numbers as, as the questions were coming in, right? And in 2019, probation numbers um, were, at, were at like 13,400, right? So pulled the June 30th um, numbers for it. And 2019, they were at like 13,000. And it's, you know, 2020 was at 11,000, right? And then that kind of like dropped in 2021 down to 8,000. Like, I think that that is, you know, I don't know that we'll ever know, right? You can't ever say that this is numbers are coming down because those cases are getting adjudicated and deprivation numbers are coming up a little bit. So I think that this, this fluctuation in the numbers, um, you know, I think that it's, it's going to be interesting over the next couple of years just to see how things continue to kind of move around. All right. Um, I think we time for like maybe let's do um there's a question i hate to like you can hear me yes yeah. i hate to take like the questions or but there's a there's like a two there's a question about that, that was asked early on about um because you guys had talked about like how sometimes it's one of the special conditions can be um to obtain your ged right or there's conditions related to education and one of the questions that was asked is our GED class is provided while an individual is in custody. Um, and so I just wanted to um, kind of hit on that. Um, so we do, we are um, codified to partner with the Delaware Department of Education to provide education services um, in our facilities, right? And the Department of Education is going to come in and provide educational services to um, all of our sentence population at level five. And then um, at level five, our detentioners and at level four, anybody who kind of qual who qualified in the community for um, services under the ID Act. So um, under the uh, Individuals with Disabilities in Education Act. Um, if they were if they receive those services prior to their incarceration and they've not hit their 23rd birthday, um, Department of Education is going to provide services in those circumstances to detentioners and to level 
to level four, um, people who are at level four. Department of Education is going to assess everyone um, for their kind of like educational functioning level and um, educational um, opportunities are, are offered towards, you know, GED attainment or uh, post-secondary, you know, really kind of depending on where the, where the person is. So yes, those services are provided um, while the individuals are in custody. And then also supported um, uh, out on, um, you know, if people are out on uh, probation and parole through, um, you know, the, the 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 pass that anyone in the community would take through through adult um, education services with the state. So Missy or Heidi, that that kind of. I think that's basically, I know that we didn't get to all the questions. And again, um, I think most of the questions were asked with people's names. So we'll be able to get back with you. I, if I'm talking, I can't hear you. So I want to stop talking. Um, I, I thank everyone for their patience. I, th that's about all the time we have. I'm going to give, um, I'm going to mute myself and, and turn um, Deputy Chief Collier and a direct Director Kern Kearney back on. Um, and I'm going to stop talking and we're having a lot of Technical difficulties. I appreciate everyone kind of work being patient with us through it. So thank you all for attending. Um, again, the webinar will be up on the YouTube department's YouTube channel. We will have copies of the um, PowerPoint uh, sent out to participants. And if you attended for the vast majority of the the webinar, we will also provide um, you with uh, a certificate of attendance. Um, but I'm just going to turn it over to um, the community corrections just to kind of uh, wrap us up and then we will say good evening and please keep a lookout for our next webinar. And I just want to say thank you all for participating and it, I we just want to put it out there how probation and parole really operates. So I appreciate everybody's attention um, this evening. And I agree 100%. We have come leaps and bounds for even like the last two years in some of our progressive strategies. And our officers are constantly on board with us. They work with us and they make things happen. We give them the tools and they make ideas really turn into reality for us. And they've done a very good job at being on top of like cutting edge probation compared to other states. I get to go visit a few other states and I look at Delaware and I'm like, I'm, I'm very glad like we are so progressive and the way we've really kind of come together to really balance, again, it's all balance our community safety with our reentry efforts. So I know a lot of the teams on here tonight. So thank you team for joining us. I mean, you're very important to this discussion. Community members, if you have ideas, please share them with Director Kearney and I, we'd love to hear them. And I want to thank everyone for participating in tonight's discussion. Thanks, everyone. Good night.